Hello and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is a second talk in the third chapter of uh, faculty seminar series that uh, we have been doing in computer science department. Uh, this talk is uh, going to be given by Milan Sohani. The speaker needs no introduction. He is uh, an eminent faculty member of computer science department, the head of Sitara. And uh, this talk I would like to mention is a CSE Sitara talk. Uh, but I can see a lot of faces uh, interested from all areas of engineering science here. Um, so the talk is about the elite university and are we too selective? So without much ado, let me pass the mic over to Milan. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for, for giving me this uh, the stage and this opportunity to talk to all of you. So my name is Milin Soni and I'm going to talk, I'm uh, the current head of Sitara and also a faculty member in uh, CSE. So I'm going to talk about the elite university and are we too choosy or too selective. <coughs> so by the way, this talk is joint work, is ongoing work uh, with Vinish uh, from School of Management and an MTech student, uh, Monik, uh, who's here as well. Monik? Yeah, Monik is here. <coughs> so, um, and I must also thank placement office uh, for a lot of data which they did, which they gave me and they shared and a lot of help in uh, other uh, slightly confidential data. <coughs> so the motivation for this talk is actually uh, the gaping inequality that we see in our society, you know, poor development outcomes. But there are, you know, uh, very old institutions and uh, the governance structure is there, but we see very poor governance and, <coughs> and also there seems to be an allocation problem, you know, where there is where we want engineers to be, there are no engineers and where we want engineers, uh, where we don't or don't really need them, they seem to be there. <coughs> so I think that uh, this, uh, the, the basic question was that how is knowledge being formed in our society and you know, how is it being transmitted. So that was a major research area for me and I've been looking at it for the last four or five years. So this is uh, the third sort of uh, paper in this series that we are investigating. <coughs> So also, by the way, this uh, knowledge and development, how knowledge is formed and transmitted. In 2011, uh, Joseph Stiglitz also pointed to the same issue that knowledge transmission and development are intimately related. <laughs> so here is the talk outline. I'm going to talk first about uh, the elite Indian university, that what are its features and how, how elite are we really and how, how is it and, uh, or what is the role of society and uh, the university. The second is I'm going to look at uh, the placement data. So after all, for any uh, educational institution, what do the graduates do after they graduate is an important measure. And we are going to look at that. And uh, we'll set up the methodology analysis and come up with some preliminary conclusions. Then uh, for a deeper analysis, we'll have to look at how an economy actually uh, measures abilities and you know, gives wages. So what are the productive processes and by which wages are determined. And then we will apply this sort of theory to the data and come up with some conclusions. <coughs> so we will actually compute wage curves for IIT Bombay. <coughs> and then the final, uh, final issue is about you know, the political economy or you know, as they say, what is the meaning of a meritocracy and uh, are we really satisfying those uh, axioms? So I will propose some axioms based on Stiglitz again and just check whether we are satisfying those axioms. Are we really a meritocracy and how do we fail it or do we pass it and so on. <coughs> And finally, uh, you know, I'll spend some time on how do we uh, come out of uh, these, some of these problems that I will point out. <coughs> so uh, first of all, um, you know, it's clear that the society and university form a very important uh, virtuous cycle. You know, uh, the university is the repository of uh, all knowledge and practices and, <coughs> and in, in turn, and the university receives support from society and in turn, the university actually produces agents or employees which who find place in society you know working and as workers in factories as singers you know as uh, civil society agents or whatever <coughs> so um, it is you know so this virtuous cycle is really how the university and society get connected <coughs> so the elite university of course is uh, much more important it is supposed to provide thought leadership you know the arts and you know long term research and is in a way connected to the destiny of this society Right? So it is also a symbolic of what this society values. So, <coughs> so it is in that sense, the elite university is quite important. <coughs> so uh, in this talk, I'm going to look at, you know, there is an input side of how 
you know how students are selected and what are they trained and you know how they enter the university. We are not going to look at that. We are going to look at the output side. So as you know, how do graduates? Where what op career options do they take? And what are they? You know, what are their compulsions? And how does it benefit our society? So this talk is only about the output side of of the picture. <coughs> So by the way, stop me if there are some quick questions. Otherwise, you know, we can we can you know I'll take questions at the end. So, uh, so first of all, you know, uh, let's talk about the Indian elite uh, university. So it has a long history. I mean, the university of course started in 1850s, the modern university, uh, but the uh, the true elite university started uh, after independence. The first is of course the IITs, which started in the 1950s, ISCs, ISIs. IIMs, TIFR, uh, you know, JNU, there are many such now, many universities and they actually, one key feature is that they cover most of the areas of, you know, knowledge. So for example, uh, economics, science, technology, social science, mathematics and so on. <coughs> so there are of course new ones coming up like the new ICERs and some new IITs, right. <coughs> and key features of these elite institutions are that they are centrally funded typically. Uh, fully, they are autonomous, uh, they have a research orientation, internationally trained faculty and a, a fairly transparent and highly uh, selective admissions of students and a focus on excellence and global standing. So these are some of the key features of our elite, you know, are, you know I mean these are well understood and I think that, uh, <coughs> uh, I think that is pretty clear. <coughs> Right, so uh, now let us look at how, how elite are the IITs. So you may ask why focus on the IITs. Well, the first reason is that we are here. So I am here at IIT, you are all students of IIT or faculty members or some way connected with IIT. And the second is that, uh, you know, <coughs> engineering and technology is of course very important for development outcomes. You know, Sadak, Bijli, Pani are all engineering services and really, you know, it is us engineers who are supposed to deliver uh, these outcomes. <coughs> So it is, uh, you know, uh, so that is why we will focus on the IITs. Just to give you a picture, you know, roughly 200,000. So these numbers are in crores. So in the education, I mean, you know, uh, uh, Indian budget is roughly 200,000 crores, of which 60,000 crores comes from MHRD, right? And from, <coughs> so from that, about uh, the centrally funded institutions command about 3,000 crores, of which the IITs consume 2,000 crores. Okay, so this is how, uh, you know, this is how the budgets look like. So for example, IIT Bombay uh, support from MHRD is roughly 200 crores, give or take 50 crores. <coughs> I, I think this, re, this is reasonable. <coughs> so I may be making errors of plus minus 20, 25 percent, <coughs> but this is the ballpark. So as such, if you look, uh, <coughs> you know, you may say that 2000 crores is a very small fraction of 200 crores, uh, 200,000 crores, but it is still 1 percent. And per capita investments per student or per student is roughly 10 to 15 lakhs per student. So that is the, that's the number uh, that we are talking about. <coughs> so uh, besides this, the IITs also get roughly equivalent support from various research agencies like DST, DBT, Ministry of IT and so on. So our, you know, the investments roughly doubles. <coughs> so just to give you, uh, you know, just to put things in perspective, if you look at the Mangalyan project, it was roughly 400 crores. Then if you look at ISRO, its budget, annual budget is 5,000 crores. Then, uh, you know, Maharashtra Water Supply and Sanit, you know, Water Supply and Sanitation Department, which services 28,000 gram panchayats in Maharashtra, has a budget of about 1,000 crores. And Mumbai University, with 600 affiliated colleges, has a budget of 400 crores. Okay, so, so that tells you what the ballpark, uh, you know, what is the kind of support that we get and you know per capita and what are our you know what's the sort of uh, relative picture <coughs> so uh, so it's more than the money it is the intellectual space that the iits occupy right that is far more important <coughs> so if you look at the exams you know the je and gate je define you know what uh, what training an in, a student needs to start doing engineering and gate defines what finishes you know what is the training which you expect from an engineer. So these, both these are administered by the IITs, right. <coughs> and if you look at TechWIP2, a World Bank project uh, to, uh, 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 World Bank project to improve the education, uh, technical education quality in India, you know, it says on chapter 1, page 1, 
that uh, <coughs> the gap between other colleges and IITs needs to be bridged and that IIT should play a catalyst, the role of a catalyst, right. So, <coughs> so it is very important that, you know, if we are the role models to all engineering colleges in, in India, then what exactly are we up to, right. So that is very important that we understand that. <coughs> So, of course, we dominate the research agenda, research funding, you know, allocations and moreover nowadays uh, many state government, uh, you know, school curriculum are now orienting themselves to these entrance exams, right. So, if you look at NCRT or even Andhra Pradesh uh, state board, they are, their definition of what is science actually is based on what is being taught or what is needed to get into IIT or what is being taught in IIT and so on. So, the definition of science in higher, you know, in school is itself dominated by what IITs, you know, <coughs> are doing or teaching. So, I think that besides of course, the, the social, the sociology that we IITians are, we have the bragging rights in this, in this country, we go out, we are an IITian and, you know, we lots of doors open. <coughs> so, I think that I need not go uh, through the process, you know, that there is the JE and there is advanced JE and so on, yeah, just I suffice it to say that roughly 1 in 200 applicants gets in. So, the odds of getting into IIT is 1 in 200, which is fantastic. I mean, nowhere in the world, you know, even in China, you know, the, the odds are not that, not that hard, okay. So, not that difficult. So, so, of course, so I will call this as my measure of selectivity, 1 in 200, that is the selectivity by which students get in, okay. This, of course, if you go to get into computer science, you are probably 1 in 2000. Right. So, the selectivity changes by discipline, right. Uh, at the PG level, we have the disciplinary gate exam, again roughly the selectivity is 1 in 200. Of course, that, but the, you know, they inherit the selectivity from the department. So, a mechanical engineering gate versus a computer science gate has, you know, they have inherited that the, you know, the, the, the selectivity of the parent department, okay. So, that's, so that we know. So now, uh, let us look at the output side more carefully. So we have, you know, so the university actually is producing, you know, is feeding employees or agents into three sectors, it is the companies, the state and of course, civil society. So company needs employees, states need department engineers and civil society needs artists, you know, authors, uh, sportsmen and so on. So an output of, of a university can be, you know, classified into these three, uh, these three uh, core sectors and these in turn serve our, <coughs> so these are serve our society. So, what I am going to look at is the placements or the output of our, uh, of the IITs and see what sectors do they go into the economy, how do they serve the economy, what companies do they join and <coughs> who owns these companies and what do these, com who serve, you know, these companies, whom do they serve. So, that is our basic, uh, uh, basic analysis. <coughs> Okay. So, here is the, so the basic question is who joins where, where are people going. <coughs> so, this we have looked at uh, the 2013 placement data. So, uh, so uh, you know about, you know around March between 80 and 90 percent of the placement was done in 2013 by March or April, in the middle of March. So, I am looking at the, you know the seven key uh, engineering departments. So, aero, chemical, civil, uh, CSE electrical, mechanical and material science and the three key programs of B.Tech, dual degree and M.Tech, okay. So, I am not looking at the two year or five year MSCs and the smaller programs of energy, uh, Sitara or you know others or MDES and so on or PhD. So, I am looking at the key, you know the core, the, the you know the biggest chunk of, uh, of this data and that is about mm, 833 of, you know, so about 81 percent of the total people who actually got jobs through the placement office in 2013, okay. So, the sample is a large sample or uh, you know a fairly, you know a majority sample of the 1000 people who were placed. So, it is about <coughs> uh, uh, you know 833. So, of this 324 were uh, B.Tech students, 180 were dual degree students and 329 were M.Tech students, okay. Is this framework clear or any? Any quick questions? So, is it clear? So, 2013 placement office, placement data, core engineering, B.Tech, dual degree, M.Tech and so this is the data that we will look at, right. So, here is the, the first point. So, here are, uh, so I will just use the pointer. So, here are the, uh, 
So I have just the 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 rows are the programs, and the columns are uh, are the departments. Okay, and each entry, for example, 32 comma 11, that 32 people were placed from chemical dual degree, and the average salary, annual salary in rupees lakhs was 11 lakhs. Okay, so let's look at this table carefully. So you'll see first of all that the CAC B Tech commanded an average salary of 33.4 lakhs per annum, okay, and the M Tech was 14.8, and you you will see you know you you know just stare at this you'll see what the uh, <coughs> what it looks like. Is it clear? Yeah. Any uh, is the data clear? So this is the first table that I would like to I would like to show you. So <coughs> so of course you know the Indian economy has uh, yeah. Correct. It is including the foreign placement. So I will I will come. I will classify. So I will classify these foreign placement, domestic placement, and so on. So we'll come to that point. <coughs> so uh, here you'll you will see first of all that these numbers don't add up to hundred because there are you know there are some others which I have not put. So the the others column I have deleted. The UGs tend to do a lot of other things compared to the dual degrees or MTECs. Okay. So here in general you'll see that. <coughs> so you'll see first of all. That the MTEX do far, you know, the you know the MTEX command a far lower salary than the BTEX. Okay, so is the training different? No, but the selectivity of the students, the the point of selection was different, right? So JE exam is much more highly placed than the than the GATE exam, right? So we see that that is seen here, right? <coughs> okay. <coughs> so by the way, you will see here that. Uh, <coughs> So the dual, you know, roughly, you know, I mean, the electrical dual degree is 16.4. Uh, this is the second high, or the the highest after the CSE BTEC. And then there is a rough parity between the uh, BTEC and the dual degree, and there's a sharp drop in the MTEC column. Right? Everywhere there's a big drop. Okay. So the next category, yeah. <coughs> the next, is, yeah. What's the selectivity for the, for the gate? For gate, it is difficult. So I will come to it. For gate, it is because they in, you know, I am. They they tried to probably get into CSE, didn't get it, so did mechanical, and then from mechanical to here, it's roughly one in two hundred again. You know, it changes for, from discipline to discipline, but it is roughly you know top one percentile or two percentile get it, <coughs> or half percentile get it. Is it of the same order as it is for JEE? Yeah, but it, they have inherited the you know the discipline time selection. They have inherited. Okay, so <coughs> M Tech mechanical admission and. And MTech computer science, though they may have, you know, in the own own stream, it may be one in two hundred, but at at the BTech time. <coughs> okay, so here is the other sector-wise data. So this sector-wise, this classification is done by placement office, right? And uh, we also did it using the NSSO NIC classification. They roughly match, but I'm using the placement office classification here, and you'll see that <laughs> so the first surprise. So these are the class sectors: engineering and ET, finance, IT. Fast moving consumer goods, then uh, consulting, R and D, education, and others. Okay, so this is the rough classification, and we see here that <coughs> in the B techs, right, <coughs> only 22 percent of the B techs actually went in for engineering, right? <coughs> the 24 percent went in for finance, 21 percent for consulting, and 24 for IT. So roughly one fourth spent across the three service sectors. And one fourth in the core engineering sector. Fine. <coughs> now, in for the dual degree, it's roughly the same picture, except that you know the consulting is a bit higher and the IT is a bit lower. Fine. <coughs> and for the M Tech, 50 percent of the you know M Techs actually went in for engineering jobs, ET jobs. <coughs> but you see here that <coughs> in if you look at all the major sectors, the engineering salaries are the lowest. So you see that ET is 10.2, 13.0, 13, 23, then 10.0, 13.2, 11.6, 12.9, 8.6, the major other sectors, you know, 15.0, and well, non IT. <coughs> right? So engineers are actually paid the least amongst all possible sectors, right? Largely speaking, right? <coughs> so the second class, so this is just by, uh, you know, just by sectors and and programs and degrees. Now the second classification we did was by company ownership, right? So, so company, you know, so there are the company ownership and location of the job. So.
So, if a, you know, if a company may be a multinational or an Indian owned company serving a global society or an Indian society. So, this can be you know we this classification was done by you know by looking at their uh, sometimes at their web pages or their uh, you know uh, annual reports or some <coughs> and uh, we, we did this classification. So, I will just explain this. <coughs> so, here are the five classifications that we make. The super GG is you know globally owned global revenues and the locations abroad. Okay, students place you know getting in global companies you know serving a global clientele and you know place. So, an example of this in 2013 was Sony Japan. Okay, Sony hired people and they placed them in, in Japan somewhere. Okay. Then GG is globally owned global revenues placed in India. So, all the other four are Indian okay. and an example is Goldman Sachs. Right. <laughs> Indian owned global revenues Infosys which did not you know in, didn't hire anyone, but the, this is a typical example of an Indian owned company which is serving a global clientele. Okay. <laughs> and uh, a globally owned Indian revenue. So, another example Procter Gamble or for example, Samsung Electronics right. <laughs> and finally, the Indian owned Indian revenues you know for example, Tata Motor. Is that clear? So, this classification is clear right. So, just classifying companies by who you know who which you know where, what is the ownership and where are the revenues coming from. You know after all we expect that a company serves a particular society and you know and uh, you know and this, this service actually benefits the society right. So, we will we have we are going to use this. And then we then we classify by program across these five sectors right. Then we see here that the super GGs you know this 15 percent. So, now these are in percentage. So, 15 percent of the BTECs actually went abroad for jobs in the super GG and their average salary was 46.8 lakhs. Okay. <coughs> then uh, the GG companies you know 41 percent of the BTECs actually went for global companies serving a global client like LinkedIn or Google or Mercedes you know or uh, Airbus right. <coughs> and then uh, <coughs> you know so this is IG. So, Indian companies with uh, so only 7 and GI and well Indian companies 21 percent with an average salary of 7.3 lakhs. Okay. And if you look at the dual degree, <coughs> if you look at the you know a similar you, you see a similar pattern and for the M tech uh, <coughs> the major the major sector is this the global companies you know uh, 56 percent of the people uh, M tech students actually went in for global companies with a global clientele exactly like General Electric or you know companies like this. <coughs> so, if you see here the you know the II sector is really 21, 19 and 15 and is the lowest paid. Okay. <coughs> so, here is you know the whole table in more detail right. So, we see here that <coughs> you know it is essentially all the average numbers are here. So, for example, if you look at ET engineering technology. Well, the total number of students placed in ET out of 830 or 830 is 281, right? In finance 134 and so on, IT 198. So these are the totals, okay? But of these, you will see that the GGs are 116, right? So out of these 281, a full 116 have gone to global companies serving a global client, right? So those serving an Indian client, you know, the Indian society are num number 24 and 64. So, a total of 88 students or 88 graduates from roughly 800 actually ended up being engineers for Indian society, right. So, that is what the data says, <coughs> yeah. Why do not you classify uh, IT with uh, ED? Well, LinkedIn is an IT company. So, it is not clear what, what skills. Are. So, uh, one thing that I did was what are the skills that we train them for? you know. So, we do not really particularly train them do any training for IT. Even in computer science not clear what is what is an IT training. <coughs> so, it is a service it is a general generic you know service sector job. <coughs> is that clear? So, this we see that I mean the table or if you look at GG or if you look at finance then it is clear that you know I mean I think I think the data speaks for it yeah. Well, there are, you know, there are many computer engineering or you know product 
you know, say, you know, for example, Microsoft, your Autodesk, AutoCAD, so many, I mean, proprietary products, right? So, for example, you know, there are so many GIS companies, uh, uh, you know, Arc Info or whatever, Arc GIS. LinkedIn is, uh, it's an IT company. LinkedIn is also, well, I, okay, yeah. Correct, correct. So, we have, you know, so all basically the Excel sheet, you know, will be put up, you know, you can look at the data and, you know, <laughs> examine. So, for example, Atkins, so is it an engineering design company or a consulting company or, for example, PricewaterhouseCoopers. So, we need to, you know, we need to, you know, we need to do that classification carefully. So, we have done as far as we could do. <clears throat> so, we looked at their web pages, we looked at what was the profile which the, you know, the JAF, you know, what was being posted by the company. Yeah. So, this is the, this, yeah. Salary in foreign placement should be corrected for price in uh, Correct, correct. So, in fact, I, in the future analysis, I am going to ignore the super GGs because they, they are not, you know, you know, if I, if I am, I am going to look at locations in India because I am going to uh, plot what are the, you know, what are the wage productivity curves for India. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Good. Yeah. So, uh, <coughs> so by the way, the second thing that we did was how much does CPI matter, right? After all, we are training them, you know, in so many courses and, you know, <laughs> right? So, does CPI matter at all, correct? We, I mean, you know, a typical student would have, would do about 15, you know, chemical engineering, so we do 15 courses in chemical engineering or maybe more, right? So, we expect that if you are spending so much effort in it, that ultimately a better CPI should matter, right? So, here is what I have done is that we have just regressed for each category, we just regressed on, on you know, computed a slope, you know, how does, by their CPIs and then whether that slope, if we, if, if it is statistically significant, right. So, if only then we report it, correct. And then we see here that the only statistically significant, you know, slopes are these 0, 0, 0, 0, say at 5 percent is and these. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So, these are, <coughs> these are the sectors where CPI matters, right. And you will see here that the sectors are IT super GG, II consulting, II FMCG, GG finance, GG IT and a final one where ET matters that is Indian companies working for global clients. So, global clients like CPI, right, Indian clients do not care. Right, that is what the data said. <coughs> it could be that the global clients have exhausted the top CPI. Exhausted the top CPI? Yeah, so you have shaved off the top CPI in, in, in. Yeah, maybe, but maybe. I mean, so then maybe. The Indian clients don't like high CPI. Well, but then, but then that still tells us something to do, right? Yeah, it, I mean, we should probably not. I mean, you know. <laughs> We should maybe not we fail people at seven or God, God knows what. I mean, something, you know, it does tell us something to do, right? <clears throat> so the point here is one important point. Yeah. Yeah, I've you know both. You know, I have just kept those which seemed very small because there were some you know which were completely insignificant. Okay, so I've not listed all the you know the major categories and all engineering categories I've listed. Okay, all the engineering categories are here. So, you see here that, <coughs> so you will see what the slopes are. By the way, on this side are the Gini coefficients. So, the Gini, you know, a, a large Gini coefficient means that the salaries are, you know, varying in that sector. So, there must be some other knowledge other than CPI, like for example, whether you, whether you are MI organizer or not, that right, seems to matter, correct. So, <coughs> a large, uh, you know, Gini coefficient tells you that there is some other metric which is going to, which is mattering. So, here you see that, for example, you know, GG finance has a very large, you know, you know, it's, uh, it, it has a very large coefficient. Here you will see other, you know, 209, 198, 213 and so on, right. So, the, so, so by the way, so why do the service sector companies, the GGs care about your CPI? Well, they implement it by a cutoff, right. All students know that they, they just 7.5 cutoff or 8 cutoff. So, they do not really particularly care about your CPI, they are implemented by cutoff. They do not really look at your transcripts or talk to your guides or look at specific courses in which you have done, they just 
six or six point five, seven point five, eight cutoff and implemented. <coughs> so, any questions? So, here are <coughs> you know so there are more detailed data sets uh, you know on which on the in the paper and also in you know I will put it up on the web page <coughs> eventually. So, here is what you know one can conclude that from this very small uh, <coughs> Uh, sampler that global companies serving global consumers is the biggest winner of our IIT placement, right? And the, in addition to that, the super GB. <coughs> and we also see that engineering is the least paying of all major sectors, right? So they, <coughs> right? And Indian engineering from there is even much smaller, right? India is even smaller, and about 10 percent of our output actually goes to Indian companies doing engineering for Indian society, right. <coughs> okay. <coughs> we see that the MTech program, you would think that we like to think that the MTech program is our, you know, is the real service to the country, right. You see that, you know, MTech program largely serves engineering, global engineering, right, the global service, engineering service sector, that is what it is serving, <coughs> right. And UG programs really serve finance and consulting, <coughs> okay. And most of these profiles do not need you know any of your engineering training or they at least are not responding to the training that we are giving. So, these are the conclusions that we are <coughs> that is what the data shows. <coughs> so, obviously, this is a very serious I think that this is a very serious issue and we must look at it very carefully. Okay, so, <coughs> so now, uh, so there are let us look at the two problems. There is a misallocation away from engineering and away from the Indian economy, right. So, remember that IIT is not MIT, IIT is a state funded institution, correct? Yeah. Yeah, so actually I have tried to understand, you know, you know, for example, a lot of, hi, yeah, yeah, we are sure, I have tried to, I, by the way, I, so, I have tried to keep track, but it is not easy. So, in fact, I have my recommend my recommendation at the end of this is to you know is for MHRD to you know for at least state funded institutions have a very clear idea of where what are the people doing, <coughs> right. So, I think that is a very important uh, point. So, anyway, so there are uh, <coughs> two accusations that or rather two you know conclusions that that are inescapable is that there is misallocation for a state funded institution away from engineering, away from the Indian economy, right. And the second is that, uh, you know, our training seems to be relevant, right. <coughs> so, the average salary for a service sector may be, you know, may 10 lakhs and the average salary for an engineer is 6 or 6.5 lakhs. So, are we, are we capable of delivering an extra 3.5 lakhs value? That is a question that we need to ask, right. <coughs> is our training good enough to raise the engineering salaries? from 6.5 to 10 or whatever, 8 or 10, 12. <coughs> so, I think that it is, you know, it should, it should matter in better salaries, it should help Indian engineering companies. Yeah. Yeah. I will come to that, I will, I will come to that point. Uh, I will come to, I will come to that, I will come to that. So, this is a, this is another, you know, where are the engineering jobs? Right, you're gonna. So then, well, th there are many responses to this. Why are we running big departments with? You know, there are no engineering jobs, right? In say, say or whatever. Why are we running, running such big departments? We don't need to. Correct. So that is one level of response. But I, I will, you know, I will elaborate on that further. <coughs> so it is really required that we understand what is the cause for this. <coughs> so you know, so in an economy, we must understand how does production of value actually happen. So, I have just showed you some two pictures of two different blacksmiths, okay. But in general, there are, you know, <coughs> say if you look at biscuits, there are various machines, you know, M1, M2, M3 or facilities or factories. And <coughs> so, for example, here you will see that uh, a machine M1 or facility manufactures 10 tons per day and the operator ability, say, normalized between 0 and 1 is 0 0.3, right. And a more advanced machine M2 produces 50 tons per day and, and op needs, a, needs a more clever operator with a skill of 0 0.4 and M3 200 with a skill of 0 0.6, right. So, is this clear that there are different machines? So, in an economy for the same, you know, output, there are different machines which are 
producing different goods and they need a uh, different levels of ability or skill at <coughs> at manipulating those machines right so <coughs> so it's like i mean we could have done it for other cycles or you know uh, banking or other you know other sectors as well <coughs> so the point is but of course that so this productivity per worker translates into wage, wages or the salary after taxes rents training costs capital costs and so on is that clear so <coughs> So, if for example, if we just looked at biscuits, then this would be the sort of the <coughs> wage, you know, productivity curve, which is that. So, there is a minimum mobility which is needed to produce biscuits. There is a maximum mobility which is needed to produce biscuits. Beyond which, there is not going to be any salary rise. Is that clear? So, for example, at T1, if your if your ability was less than 0.3, then you're not in the biscuit market. If your ability is between 0 0.1, 0 0.3 to 0.6 then you would be allocated to some machine. If your ability is beyond 0 0.6, well, your salary is not going to change. You are too smart for the job, but you are going to get the same money. Yeah. Yeah. No, it may. I mean, so actually, so good. So I, I'll, I'll uh, right, right. More than so different skills. So actually, so this, these are all stylized. You know, what are abilities, right? So actually, you, you have come to a point where, you know, abilities are they JE level abilities? Are they English speaking abilities? Are they to be press buttons on a screen correctly? What sort of? But let me just use a straight line. You know that there is one straight line on which I am plotting abilities. So this is a stylized version. I am just trying to explain, I mean for, for me to do that, so this is just a stylization. Mm -hmm. Relative values do not necessarily make sense here, that is what I am trying to point out. So actually, I mean that is paper that study 4 which is coming and it is about how do rents actually materialize in this society. Okay, so we will take it up, you know, in, in fact you are right. So a lot of our elitization is coming about because, you know, machines are too powerful and now you have to select one person from 100 applicants. So, you use your J rank, it does not really matter. Okay, it does not, you know, the operator who operates, say, Goldman Sachs, right, is, is no clever, or you just need some person who will, who will do the job, provided he is in the top 10 percent, right. So, then you can, you know, so I let us not go into, you know, so a lot of these elitization is actually happening because of overproduction. So, let us, we can come talk to that later. So, this is a simple sort of ability to wage curve, right. So, so if you have, uh, so it is clear that if you are between this, then you are going to be in the biscuit, uh, you are employable in the biscuit market. But if you are beyond that, well, sorry, tough luck, you are going to get, you know, you are going to be paid the same as uh, anybody in 0.6, right. So of course, that in a typical economy, there are many products, right. So here you see that there are, <coughs> so the banks, uh, banking jobs, cycle manufacture, biscuit production and so on. So all these curves will overlap, you know, wage curves will overlap. And you see that how jobs, how people with different abilities get allocated to jobs, right. So, here you will see that people under A0 are unemployable. Between A0 and A1 are going to go to biscuit market. Uh, between A1 and I think A3 are going to be employed in the, in the cycle shop, right. And beyond A3, you are going to get a banking job, right. So, just by the machines which are producing these items or the facilities and the abilities that they need we can come up with well, how exactly is the allocation happening, right. So, it is very clear that for a person you need to identify your ability and convey it to the employers and by that you know you the job market actually happens. Is this clear? So, essentially the IITs or whatever uh, university performs an important role of labeling ability, right. Otherwise, you know if you employ, employ you in the biscuit here and you, you mess it all up then that is not good. <coughs> Okay, right. So, so now I'm going to actually compute these curves for the five or six major sectors in in uh, in the India uh, in the uh, in the IIT placement game. And these are I have picked up. You know, I'm going to ignore the super GG. I'm going to look at these six or seven uh, six sectors which have employed more than 50 students. Okay. So what I'm going to do is on the y-axis I'm going to plot their salaries. On the x-axis their abilities. Now, how do I, you know, plot the abilities? 
So, what I am going to do is since CPI does not matter, I am going to plot it using J rank or J, you know the department ranking. Right? So, I am going to rank the department pro, you know and then rank the uh, M tech and the B tech department and merge them and then just plot it you know. <coughs> so, here is the you know here is the x axis right. So, the <coughs> so this is 6 is the top and th this is the ordering for the UGs. So, by the way so B tech others does not matter. If you are not CAC or double, X, double E does not matter you are club together ok <laughs> fine. So, CAC E by the way that is how the data shows right. So, it does not matter whether if you are not in CAC or double E does not matter ok. So, <coughs> so, these are this is how I have plotted it and you know then I select you know the top entries and lo and behold here are the curves right. <coughs> so, in this you see that so, I have just you see that for example, this curve is the finance global finance curve right. <coughs> the uh, this curve that is the IT GG then this is the consulting right and these three are the engineering curves ok. So, if you see here engineering starts dominating in the M tech others right B tech others some you know you may get a consulting job, but otherwise you will have to do engineering. But for others, it is just going to be finance, consulting, IT, and so on. So, if you look at the you know, if you look at the sector, you know, the, the ability to wages curves, you know, it is very clear how the allocations are happening, right. It is because I mean, <coughs> and note that it does not really depend on what your department was, it just depends on your basically J rank or gate rank or gate department. <coughs> So, I mean this is the picture that essentially, <coughs> so excessive selectivity is actually you know we are select the selectivity is just too much and that you know <coughs> and then you have this the domestic engineering is this curve and global service is this curve right. And if you are on this side of this intersection point well you are going to get allocated into global service right. If you are in the middle somewhere like NITs well then it is something else, but if you are others then there are there are those. BPO job waiting for you if you do not want to do Indian engineering right. So, uh, the sector curves actually reveal what is going on inside the uh, you know in the allocation process. <coughs> so, uh, I am short of time. So, I will not uh, you know I mean one question is that can we not can our training does our tra can our training be up yeah. Yeah. No, so I am just saying that because you are 1 in 200 right, if you are 1 in 200 you have I mean you know there is there is if you are say if you are I mean yeah I mean sorry sorry yeah. So, if your selectivity or the skill that you exhibit is really is is over here then you know for your skill level you are going to skip domestic engineering and go to global service right. So, the point really is that if you want to place people in Indian engineering, there is no need for any skill identification more than this. Okay. Now, the point is that if you are labeled oh he is a IT whatever you know AIR 200 right, just the process of labeling has identified you right. So, if you say he is in the top 10,000, now Deutsche Bank will be confused. Right? Is this clear? So, what I am saying is that if you just label that he this is the top 10,000, this is the next 10,000 or whatever top you know 20, 50,000 actually. So, at here this point is really you know out of yeah top 10 percent. You are doing away with you are doing away with branding, you are making unbranded tools basically. No label. 10 percent, top 10 percent. But in every market there is a label. Branding. Yeah, so we can talk about this. So branding, by the yeah, we can you, you can. By the way, ha, anyway, yeah, I think you know, just the, view. Ha, just the view. I think you need to write it down and you know submit it. You know, you cannot just say this is my view and so on. Hmm. <laughs> no, I mean in the sense that unbrand, no, no, branding and unbrand. These are very complex notions, yeah. right? So it's not that oh, you just you know you consume gen generic Vaseline. It's not like that. You see by in other universe for example, Berkeley, California the best uh, department in civil engineering in the US is Berkeley, California. It admits 1 in 6 
Okay. So, the admission rate at Berkeley, you know, you, you call Berkeley civil engineering is 1 in 6. Now, do you, uh, you would you call it just, oh, it just, you know, just throw away the branding? No. So, the whole point is that after you get in, there is some training which makes it, you know, <coughs> which is being done. So, they are taking people 1 in 6 and they are converting it to something special, right. So, the whole, I, actually that is a slide I missed. Oh, sorry, it's ahead. It is this, that why is our training not making them, uh, not fetching 13 lakhs in the engineer, Indian engineering market? That is the question. Yeah. Can we go back to the trap? I wouldn't put a problem on the statement that you made. Yeah. In the sense, of, it says that if you have higher ability, you go to global, sir. Because you get identified. But, but you made a converse statement saying that the engineering industry does not need ability. That does not. What, what? No, no, entering. If engineering industry, you know, domestic engineering, you do not need all this, you know, competence or the ability. This does not come out of any of these things. Is that the converse is not converse. No, so. If you have the ability, the probability is that you will go to global service. That does not mean. No, it does not mean. No, no, it does not. No, it does not mean. It does not mean what I am. Yeah. That is a statement to make. No, it does not mean that, but if you assume that there are machines which are used to manufacture stuff and what skills do you need to operate those machines or what sort of technology are Indian, Indian industries using, what you know investments in R&D are they making. So, if you look at all of that, then as it stands, they do not probably have room for you know somebody really more skilled. So, I mean they, so I am so stretching it, but there is some. Pay money. The salary in the manufacturing sector, huh. which is which is dominant, which is you need to pay because it's a global economy. So, but that's outside. I mean, in the sense, currently as it stands, as it stands, they cannot, they do not have the ability to reward higher skills. Okay, so that's all these girls are saying. So they they do not have the ability to reward higher skills. Suppose your uh, suppose one does not label beyond the knee of that green curve. Correct. Well, the pur pur purple curve would have to hold admission test, Deutsche Bank would have to go out to, because all those top 10 percent, the top 1 percent that they want are now, they could be in Surat Kal, they could be in, you know, uh, you know, Sangli, you do not know. So, they will probably have to hold independent entrance test and then identify the top 1 percent and then, you know, give them jobs. So, are you saying that it would, the corresponding cost would bring it down? Huh, they, they would bring it down. The, the cost curves would shift down, because the finding cost you know, how do you find that the sorting cost become you know, substantial. Is it clear? <coughs> okay. So, that this labeling, we are, the JE actually enables the labeling, you know, enables the identification of where are these talented guys. So, in, in principle, we are, you know, we are labeling people we do not need, right. So, uh, <laughs> now if you look at, uh, <coughs> so, but still there are a lot of people who, you know, who feels, you know, oh, there is, it is like, you know, there is gold buried, should we not discover it? No, how can it be left lying, you know, lying there? So much talent, which is wasted, right? So let them, you know, get global jobs and let's see, you know, what happens. After all, do, do they not remit the money home? Does it not, you know, create more demand in the economy and so on? So that argument also one should look at carefully, right? And see whether it, you know, holds true or not, right? So here is where I, where, you know, so I will explain how do really this globalization and production really work. So let's look at. Uh, you know, a simple company. By the way, this stylization is by Maskin and Kramer, okay. And Maskin uh, got the Nobel Prize in economics. He's from Princeton, and Kramer is an economist from Harvard. So it is not my, you know, it's a branded concoction, okay. <laughs> so, so you look at this. So it's it's yeah. so it's a so let's look at a small company which has an assistant and a manager, okay. So the assistant has skill B manager has skill A, fine. And the production is defined as A square B. So, A is, you know, the skill of the manager square times B, okay. By the way, this economist will know, this is the famous Cobb-Douglas production function, right. It is a variation of the Cobb-Douglas product. So, it is very standard, <coughs> right. So, you see that if there are, there is a person of skill 2 and skill 3, then who do you make the manager? Well, the higher skilled person you will make the manager. So, for example, uh, 3 square into 2 is 18, 
but if you made two the guy with two as two as the manager, two square is four, four is twelve, right? So it's clear that if these two people form a company, then the three person is going to be the manager, and the two person is going to be the assistant, right? <coughs> okay. So now let's look at a society. Okay. <coughs> so that you can see the I'm not looking the wages. How do the wages get divided? I'll I'll skip that. But if you look at a society, suppose this society has you know two people of you know it's composed of two two three three okay two people of ability two two people of ability three now there are two ways of forming a company so one can form a company which is two two and three three or another way is three two and three two correct so now you see here that if you form the company two two and three three your net output is 35 right but if you form it three two and three two your net output is 36 correct so it's clear that if the social output has to increase then the companies are mixed right so so there's a lower you know so you don't say that oh you two you stay apart and you form your own company we are going to form our own company no in fact it makes sense to have these mixed companies okay but on the other hand so on the other hand if you look at 2244 right so now the higher set the elite set is slightly farther ahead not 2233 three, but 2244 four. then you will see that in fact <coughs> then you will see that in fact the <coughs> 4242 two pair has a pro production of 64 and the 2244 two pair has a production of 72 right so you see that mixed companies are uh, are formed when abilities are comparable close by and when abilities are far away you know <coughs> it is the separate companies which come into <coughs> which come into play right so uh, different this farther away ab abilities farther away companies are separate abilities are close yeah huh? it's a cop douglas function so it is i mean a branded function okay strong huh? strong difference like all yeah, yeah. Huh? like all branded things you should trust it no 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 but it is no no it i think no by the way by the way, this Maskin is a, you know, he has, you know, I think he has, he has a lot of data also to show that there's a lot of, yeah, lot of productions. I mean, so the Cobb Douglas, by the way, only recently in the last 10 years is the Cobb Douglas seen to be breaking down in the US, okay. So in the last 10 years, something really fishy is happening. But otherwise, the Cobb Douglas production function held true for 50 years, okay, since the data start, they started gathering data. <coughs> yeah. No, so actually there are, no, 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 so I agree. So these are, so by the way, so there are many papers which connect ability in one country with ability in another. For example, now if you look at the PISA, you know, the ratings, ACER or PISA ratings, the top 1%, yeah. That's not one dimensional at all. They give a breakdown. Correct, correct, correct. So I think that, but there are a lot of research is, you know, when people migrate from here to some other, you know, what, if they, are, if they have these skills, how does it, you know, translate to skills in that other economy. There is a lot of work which, which has happened. So, I mean these are all stylized models, but stylo have some validity. So, basically just you know the, the point to note is that separate companies when abilities are far apart, mixed companies when abilities are close by, right. Yeah, so now let us look at globalization, right. So, supposing that you have a, your own society 2233 three, and you have a you know a, Society which is six six nearby near you, okay, right? There's another society, and you have your society two two three three, and that society is six six. So before globalization, you know, you would have done this your three two company. This would have started a six six, right? Now, <coughs> supposing that you those three three, you make them sit for an exam, and then you discover that they are actually four four. That they pass the entrance exam, and they are now labeled four four. Now what happens is the first thing what happens is that they will you know form this company, right? The the two three will break down and two two four four will start. And if you globalize, then this is the new society. And in fact, you will see that two two and the six four and six four dominate, right? So <coughs> actually, what happens is that those four four join companies with the six guys and form companies together. Correct? <coughs> so if you see this, 
what happens is that you know let's just understand what's happening well after global even more inequality and one key important result is that there are far fewer managers in your economy now in the 2233 there were two managers and two assistants in your new economy there are you know <coughs> there are one manager with of skill level 2 and three assistants and in the in the other society there are two managers 66 six. right so you have lost you know <coughs> you know management skills right and you have you know increased inequality and you have you know there's obviously less research on local problems because the manager is not not from your society correct so just by identi you know identifying a talent which you don't need you have you know changed all, all of these pictures right so all of this allocation and how companies form right <coughs> so essentially what i'm trying to say is that <coughs> so we are we seem to be intent on a trajectory you know so if i just say bharat india elite you know we are so you know you are making companies like this and now you see suddenly this identification you are selecting a small bracket and showing them to be of a different skill and essentially iits are ending up enabling these companies right just by just by identifying that look here are these talented people right <coughs> so they are essentially so you you know i mean the conclusion of this is that excessive identification of talent can actually be harmful in a globalized world right and that merit systems have to be very carefully designed that you have to see what can happen right you have to, you know so i think that these two are the takeaways from from whatever analysis that we did <coughs> so uh, <coughs> so i think just uh, i have 5 seven, huh? i have some 5 8 minutes eight, 10 minutes huh? okay so uh, i think that one must really i mean now step back a bit yeah uh, step back a bit and understand uh, you know what is the what are what is the political economy as they say you know how is the how is how are we organizing our society so we frequently say that yeah no we had there are still 7 8 minutes huh? well there is by the way so there is data so we have huh? no no so i i think it will be much different so for example how many people become assistants is going to be very very different so if you look at what are our you know what are huh? hmm. yeah we should look at data but i think that what do these jobs when they graduate what are they really doing in deutsche bank you know if you join deutsche bank what are you going to do right so it so i don't think that mit graduates are going to join you know they may join finance companies you know at a very different level i mean well we have to see the data <coughs> yeah huh? Yeah. If you go to the OR conference, it's not over. It. Yeah. So I don't think the uh, fact that a large number of people go to analytics and uh, no, 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 of course not. You see, but you know, j for example, we consume 65 kilos of steel per capita, right? And the you know US consume about 250 to 300, right? So we need to con you know if we are we, we have to have more buses and bridges and so on, we need to make at least 100 or 150 kilos of steel per capita. Right, so for them to move into a service sector economy is very different from for us to you know. So if you look at our you know all these industrialization measures, we are nowhere there. So we need those engineers. So here is the uh, <coughs> the final. So you know when I say some something is a meritocracy, uh, you know if it's a state funded, so it is essentially a closed loop. So there's a university which labels right, and there's a production system which uses this you know labeling and generates more output and there is a political system which distributes this output so that everyone is better off right because after all in the labeling there are winners and losers right because you know if you, you know a company does not know by label then it is you know it is going to make some average decision right. Yeah, yeah, correct, correct. So, so yeah there is a question here. So uh, in the sense then there has to be a political system which actually redistributes income and then the people in, in their wisdom say yeah i like the university right and that i support it because you know the sorting actually is benefiting me so if it's a democracy and 50% of the people must vote for the university then it all of these things must happen right so in that sense and then the you know the people vote in vote for the university so this i would call a meritocracy 
is a state funded meritocracy. <coughs> so, if you look at you know, you know how what we pass here, you know what does uh, our elite systems pass? Yeah, <coughs> so I, I think that if you look at these four, uh, four conditions, I think we fail the first three, okay. And <coughs> maybe popular support the IT's uh, elite you know, do have, right. So, we do not we do not redistribute, we do not our production systems cannot use the labeling and well our you know our labeling is of course not correct so on. so but of course we the it's do have uh, public support so why is that so really if you look at our education system it is really an exit you know hatches exit doors so you know uh, you uh, you study english you you know you are in goodwanwadi you write english you learn english and then you are in nerar then you pass engineering exam you are in you know bombay and then you you know write J and then you, you become global. So at all points you are leaving the society that you know the education is actually helping you go to the next society. It is not really training you to be a better performer. It's not closing the loop. It's not helping you you know <coughs> become a better blacksmith or a carpenter or a you know bridge manufacturer or whatever. It's a society which is helped you know oh you you are good you should go ahead to the next society. So it's actually a train in which we are you know helping people move to the next uh, next bogey <coughs> right so uh, so you'll see that uh, so you you can you know i mean there are so this assumption this train assumption is a very mysterious assumption right and so we are essentially you know we are created this fair and proper exam so that people can migrate to the next society right so so each of these is a very fair exam based on merit correct so you learn english they'll take you know and you go to the next society then you pass some other competitive exam, the next, and so on. <coughs> so it's a mysterious. I mean, I don't know why we have built such systems. <coughs> so uh, the outcome, of course, is really terrible. You know, if you look at uh, fifty percent of our people, their practices have not changed in the last fifty years. You know, they're still using the same way of you know uh, uh, the sanitation, water system. You know, this jaggery. This is a jaggery plant. By the way, look at his legs. This is a jaggery plant in Down. So all the photos in this talk are from nearby area. They are not from you know Odisha or you know really uh, Bundogal places. They are right nearby, 100, 100 kilometer as the crow flies. Huh? This is from down. Down. Huh? We don't have to go too far. Right. So now, of course, what to do? Right. The big question is what to do. <laughs> so I think that. So one is to realize that. Uh, the road, I mean, we keep talking about MIT. So, the road to MIT actually goes through Gavanwadi and goes through the kitchen of Hirabai in Gavanwadi. So, that I think we should realize that you know it is going to be the source of new problems and new engineering jobs of the highest caliber. You know, by the way, so this Chula is no, you know, not less complicated than the IC engine, right. So, I think that the focus that this realization is really very important that this is where the engineering jobs are and we need to really understand it much better. <coughs> right, so, uh, so I mean uh, what I am saying is that there has to be a slew of new companies which are you know uh, saving drinking water system from failing, better sanitation system, public transport you know, uh, uh, they, you know just enabling more public transport or more lo the logistics of it, you know influencing policy and essentially delivering efficiency and making it pay. 10 lakh rupees per annum, I think it is possible, right. Our, in, right, the GT jobs are paying 10 or 12 lakh rupees per annum. I think if we do all of this and, you know, it is possible to pay a fresh IIT graduate 10 lakh rupees per annum, if we do all of this, right, I think it is possible. So then how to do it? I think we need to, re, you know, redefine engineering. It has to be, oh, sorry, so it has to be more uh, interdisciplinary. Oh, it has to be more uh, interdisciplinary, you know, you focus on Sadak Bijli Pani engineering services, engage with society, look at the informal sector, it, you know, it is, yeah, yeah, 80, 90 percent of our manufacturing is done in the informal sector, right. So they have not, you know, that is a really big opportunity. So and of course, broad based engineering. So <coughs> whatever you do, so you know, the Amravati College is also doing the same thing, then you know, the <coughs> VNIT is doing the same thing. Kolhapur College is doing the same thing. So, and I think that is a great situation. So, if we have a broad community of engineering, then that will confuse the GGs, okay. So, I think that the allocations would be uh, more proper. By the way, that is not the point. That is not, 
Yeah, I, no, no, that's not the point. So I, I'm just saying that just for fun that it will confuse the GGs for sure. <clears throat> so I think that you know there are if you look at the history of you know even water supply, you know when did water supply come into Europe, and did it need the Navier-Stokes equation to produce water supply systems? The answer is no. Okay, it didn't. <coughs> so uh, so by the way, they still are battling with sanitation, right? So I think there are many problems which are not yet solved even for the developed world. <coughs> so I think that. Uh, <coughs> So essentially, an engineering which is full of case studies that right, which you can share. Oh, I fixed this, I did that, I redesigned this, and I implemented that, and so on. So I think the theory and practice and field work should go together. So that's the main point, <laughs> right? So, uh, so of course, MHRD, our parent department, and DST should also behave differently. So, for example, the first thing they should do is maintain data on placements in prescribed formats. Each MHRD institution must do that. That's that's the only way we'll know what's happening, right? And then they should rethink on, you know, all these fancy tech whip and gate and accreditation and so on. Because we may be we be accrediting of you know a model of engineering which we don't need, right? So we have to be careful. Then for DST, reserve a substantial part of research funding for regional outcomes. Recognize case studies and stakeholders as valid research outputs, right? <coughs> then you have various things, right? So most important is actually a shared vision of knowledge and practice, a history of science and understanding of the history of science and technology, what it really means, what was the past, what's the future, right? <coughs> and the elite, I, I, I like IIT and I think that it should be a pillar of civil society and not, you know, a handmaiden for uh, global companies or global engineering. So it should be a pillar of our, of the civil society. <coughs> so if you don't do that, the road to Gavanwadi is going to go through MIT, okay? <coughs> So that's what you know. So in other words, right? It's what's going to happen is that it is the global people who are actually going to serve Bharat, you know, through the World Bank and through you know all these other you know all these other Western elite universities. All of them have now a South Asia department, right? And they are coming here and they are solving our problems and they are solving it in the way they want it. Okay. So I think that this is important that we we have these. A shared vision of knowledge and practice. So, so there are some references. Uh, this talk will be on my web page. Thank you. Yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Real life uh, research project done by. The yeah, yeah. So I think that that I have we have we have explained. So th of course, are you right? Yeah, yeah. Well, certainly. I mean, I think the coursework and I will we can we can detail it out later. Any other? Yeah. There are two things you mentioned. Right. One was making the data companies pay ten lakhs per annum. The other is that having sorted people to a large extent to extreme selectivity, you are now letting the global companies pay for that. So the second problem can be solved by essentially privately funding the JEE. Uh, no, no. I so I think that I still think that elite institutions is a necessity. No, no. Um, huh. In that case, huh. our sorting, which is via CPI and so on, becomes a relevant sorting for those shows. Yeah, but I I think. I think I'll take it offline because this is a more involved question. Hmm. Yeah. Regarding data, I think as someone pointed out, it may be worthwhile finding out what people do say two, three years after they do it. No, no, co correct. <laughs> no, certainly. I mean, I but I think that you know, I think MHRD should really design these formats and maintain them. I think that MHRD is about time that you know it. Because these are, this is very useful. I think we, we definitely need more data. Hmm. Yep. Uh, I, I just some. like to make an observation that I don't think that we really tell our students what we expect them to do after four years. We, this is, like you said, open loop system. So the students learn whatever they want to learn and do after graduation whatever they want to do. And there are no any set expectations that we tell them. Uh, there is no indoctrination. 
So this is one, I think this is a problem. Uh, and the second thing is that there is quite a bit of disconnect between, uh, between what we do in IIT and what is needed in the country. There is quite a bit of disconnect. And I think that disconnect is not really good. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So we need to introduce that connection between the, in, between the Indian problems and what IIT does. Yeah. To bring that connection, then the country will improve certainly. No, the, no that's, that I'm saying that. So I think this is just to show that the data also motivates. So I think Sitar has been arguing for this for many years, right? So this is just saying that the data supports the argument. So data is supporting that we need to look at engineering in a very different way and something which can be shared by a lot of people, not just IIT, but by regional engineering colleges. I think broad basing the practice of engineering is really very important, you know, and that can only be done when we look at local problems. So it is per necessary that you look at, you know, so engineering as a, as a social skill, uh, you know, you know, looking at how problems are, they come about, manipulating, you know, talking to stakeholders, trying to deliver solutions. I think companies or society or, you know, collectors or whatever, hmm. or even uh, Hirabai from Kavanwadi. Hmm. Yeah. We are taking energy, how we solve problems and, uh, and technical problems. You know, you take a certain, uh, you are in a certain domain, but you you, uh, you go to an enriched domain to solve problem and you know and through a chain of interactions you go to a more enriched domain and you solve a problem there and then you finally come back. So you show, show this train where you train to get to the next stage and to the next stage and so on till, till at the end. Yeah. But what can we do as the initial step to make the loop close? Take fewer to so it's like people who are ascending the ladder. Right? So I think there are the you know the you know I have written a paper in current science about it that loop should close. And at least it says that you know what steps should be. I think that that's an easy problem. You know what should be the curriculum, what should be the coursework. I think, for example, that you know I, the two, just going out and solving real problems. I think that's the simplest thing that we should start doing. And I think that I'm not against theory at all. I love it, but it's just that it should be parallel to uh, you know uh, field observation. That's the main. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. This was a very nice presentation. Well, thanks for coming. Mm. Uh, so, at the end, I think uh, you said you had to redefine engineering and you showed some slides and pictures where you said uh, you think that this kind of salaries, uh, about 10 lakhs, can be generated. Definitely. Definitely. Well, a firm belief. Well, I, I can prove it. Is hmm. it a gut feeling or is it a, huh? is it a gut feeling? No, 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 no. I mean, uh, Sitar is running an MTech program based on that. I mean, we have not reached it, but I know it is possible. I mean, I need we need support. We need to sit down together, but it is possible. Yeah, but well, I mean, there is. You see, I'll tell you. In Shahpur Taluka, you know, spends three crores per year, at, uh, you know, and installs ten schemes, drinking water supply schemes, uh, each costing thirty lakhs rupees, roughly. You know, easily two or three fail in the first year itself. So there is thirty lakhs waiting for you to save. If you can save one drinking water scheme, you've you know made you know whatever ten twelve lakhs. So the, it is easy. I think the inherent inefficiency in our system is so much that 10, 12 lakh rupees a, uh, a year is easy money. I think it's beyond that that the fruits get higher. So then that becomes a larger governance issue in the society. Yes, but nobody has pushed the, nobody has pushed it. No, nobody. So I, I think that exact. No, no, exactly. But that's where I think that IIT is an elite institution should push that Shahpur is failing. I, we will not allow it to fail. So, I mean, in Western countries, I think more or less it's organically grown. Society, there are society needs, and there are universities which works on those needs, and there is industry which produce them in large. Correct, and correct. So it is. And I think this is the board. Is and but we continue. We continue. That's the trouble. Hmm. So, hmm. so I'm just wondering: is it possible to? Is it possible to do what you are suggesting? You know. Because it's a very big problem. No. There, is, there is a civil society, there is a political government, mm. there are institutes like this, and all of these have to work in tandem mm. to, to make this happen. And, uh, no, certainly the problem is, is big, but I think that IIT has, is elite. It is, I'm not saying that Rajaram Bapu Institute of Technology should do this. I'm saying IIT should do it because IIT has the locus standi. You know, it has the you know it has the validity. To legitimize this process, exactly. Hmm. So I think IITs can do it. Yeah.
verified. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So these are, I think that you see, I think uh, these are complicated questions. But the answer is that it does. The road does go like the way I had said. Okay, uh, the history is the you one can look at uh, many historic. I mean, I think that there is a wide body of uh, you know how is how to represent science and what are scientific discoveries. What what happened in India? Are the slums really organic enough? Are they enjoying themselves there? You know, so there are many questions. Uh, we should not just say because it's traditionally good. Or just because it is bad, I think that we need to make a. I think that you know that just recently I was reading that Charvaka and you know that Devi Prasad Chattopadhyay written about Charvak and the Upanishad and the you know the whatever and the dialogue between the Charvaka making you know the, the Ayurveda and you know completely empirical body while Upanishad completely you know well whatever a, a materialistic argument and how they so I think it's a very there is a rich tradition so we need, we need to look at. Of materialism as well as immaterialism. Yeah. Would it be worthwhile to look at? There is also not even as far as the places that you mentioned, right under our nose, we are having a training and education system which is fueling phenomenally successful industry. Successful in, in terms of the day you have, uh, we have an outline in the yard. For example, if you take the music industry, when nobody comes uh, in, into the music industry, nobody comes in the film industry so who necessarily come out of the film, FBI being a very, very beautiful exception. And I think it may, it may make a lot of sense to look at these models. Yes, definitely. Mm. Like you go to FBI, for example, I, I go there quite often. I find that everybody who's from FBI actually closes the room. Yes. You know, there's no yeah. open ended room going anywhere. Yes, yeah. No, but I think I think. Yeah, but let me now. I mean, it's completely floundering. No, yeah, sure. No, so I think that culture is a very different cup of tea. No, or music. Okay, I mean, there are culture. For example, cricket. Okay, so there are many examples. Now, does cricket need training? Does so? I think these are. I think I would like to restrict. You know, maybe if we should look at case studies. I think it needs examination. That's all. No, I, do, I have no knowledge of FTI. So I don't know. I mean, I think we should need, we should look at it. Yeah. Is there room for any theory or abstraction in the model that you Oh, plenty of room. Okay. And it seems like so, so the essentially at the macro level, the, uh, uh, I can understand how this works, but at the micro level, if a person has to contribute in the form of research. Huh. So oh, yes. So I think there is plenty of. Oh, there is plenty of research in it. Plenty of research. Yeah. So, uh, don't you think that uh, at the at the outset itself, mm. there should be a study on people who are entering the IIT system to JE? Yes. Are they really made for engineering? Yes. Do they have inclination for engineering? Yes. Maybe they are mathematicians. Yes. You know, JE makes a profit every year, two, three, several crores. 
yeah, and they can just fund uh, you know a few PhDs just uh, studying this whole problem, and they have not done it for so many years. Yeah, so, hmm. so when, when we say that they are going for IT, consultancy, finance, hmm. maybe hmm. They, they are not really made for engineering. Correct. So I think that exactly what I, I think is worth studying. Well, I mean, and there is the money. Uh, JE and Gate are making huge profits. The entry hmm. is mathematics, physics, chemistry. So, um, by the way, Gao Kao in China does not have, it has language, mathematics and it has three papers, there is language, mathematics and I forget, it does not have, I think science that it does not have. Huh? Huh? That study is important. Language? No, no, no. No, no. So the no I have that Gao Kao, I have studied how the uh, Chinese, you know, admissions work. Huh? Yeah. See, so, let No, but many or or work with you know blacksmiths, or work with you know public transport system, or work with the you know Karzat Taluka bus depot. Huh. It seems like you have to work with government, and one of the reasons why I feel, I mean, I'm kind of getting a badge. No, yeah, so by the corruption is a matter of design. Corruption is not about, it is a matter of designing protocols which, you know, which sidestep corruption. Everywhere there is corruption. I mean, if you, so by the way, that reminds me, Ashok Gadgil, professor from Berkeley was here. He said that he, when he was a student, his guide, some Rosenfeld or some really famous physician, a uh, physicist, used to travel to meet congressmen. And they were as corrupt, you know, you know, in those, you know, some Chicago club or whatever. So, but just meeting congressmen uh, and that puts a pressure. So, just meeting politicians, MPs, MLAs just uh, you know changes the discourse that you have. So, we have to make that connection. You know that just that IIT is there and you are saying okay, let, show me the show me the data set. You know I think changes the discourse. I think that is a big, big yeah, we'll offline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Go, Gautam. Offline, offline. <laughs> yeah, yeah, offline. This is, this, yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree, but it's, I, we have to, and you are from Sitara, so we can discuss this offline. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, maybe if he has something, yeah, yeah definitely. I, I have not studied, you know, school or whatever. Not really school or lower level. I, I need to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe I think we should. Uh, yeah, prefer, uh, this last question. Maybe others. I will just be outside. Huh? Just one comment. Uh, hmm. <coughs> I want, I want to say that there is a lot of No, de I think that this talk is, you know, trying to build to that because I think that I just presented in the Senate is not going to get passed. But if we give these talks, talk about it, and you know, professor, you know, then maybe there is a chance that something like this gets passed. So it is towards that definitely. Hmm. So it is to, you know, just increase the discourse on this issue. Yeah. So last question. Hmm. Yeah, this is a good, excellent point. So I am, I am saying, I am not for do gooding. Okay, I am for creating value and making money. Okay, so I am saying that you will, uh, you know, there is knowledge or there is value to be generated. 
Okay, so I am not saying, you know, I like do-gooding, but I am not relying on that. So, I, I think that developing our, so development is a perfectly valid economic job. Okay, so, I make, so do-gooding is, so, you know, is that clear? So, when I am saying that, yeah, so that is wrong, sitara or whatever, I am not for do, I mean, do-gooding is, is a private matter, is that okay? Chalo, thank you.